And so we have as our last presentation here, and it's a knockout group, Jack Porter, Randy Haken, Francis Podraska, and somebody Yifan saying, thank you very much up there. All right, well, uh, I'm Jack Porter, um, and our talk tonight is, is really about um, the power of purpose. And in the uh, tech industry in general, but in Silicon Valley specifically, there's been a major power shift. And that sh power shift has really affected the startups in like four or five different ways. And so that's what this discussion is going to be about. And we're going to start by talking about what it's been like to go from the dot com to the lean com. And Randy and I have been, we're very active as founders in the dot-com era and investors in the lean-com era. And Francis and uh, has been um, uh, in the um, lean-com uh, part of it. So uh, we're going to start with you, Randy. You know, you were involved in both pieces of it. Give us a feel for, um, you know, what it was like and uh, what kind of power shift did you see as you saw that shift from investor to founder, from um, dot com to lean com. So I'm the old guy. Huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. I'll kick us off on just some thoughts about having lived through a couple of the a couple of rounds of Silicon Valley. Um, I got started in '88 at Apple, so I've been around since '88 in the Valley. Um, I guess you know, first of all, just being a, a founder during the uh, early '90s, mid '90s. Um, the concentration, if you think about it, the concentration of venture firms and angels, those that, are, those that were kind of providing the fuel for power in the Silicon Valley was much greater than it is today because, as, as you heard just in the last talk, the democratization of investment, of uh, you know, social power, and all those things weren't, weren't around then. So, Sand Hill Road was really, in, uh, I think, almost every venture firm had it was located on Sand Hill Road, with a few um, notable exceptions. And then eventually, you actually could see over time, one by one, the VC said, "Well, we're not going to be at 3,000 Sand Hill Road. We're going to go claim our own stake," and it kind of expanded. And now you have University Ave has several very, very well-known VCs in Palo Alto. You've got VCs in Redwood City. You've got VCs in San Francisco, and it kind of just expanded a little bit. The democratization of the venture firms, but also if you think about the angel community at that time, um, was was very concentrated in a, a few uh, maybe former founders and a few uh, people who knew enough about investment in early stage that 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 was one of the key things. The other thing is. If you think about it, just the cost of a startup in the 80s and 90s was considerably different from today. I remember uh, one company I was on the board of uh, in the 90s called eCircles, which actually did fairly well. They, they were acquired uh, by classmates.com. Uh, I remember the servers alone, just to get them started, were millions of dollars. And that was the big issue. Where are we going to come up with the money just to, you know, we're exploding with users, and we can't keep up with servers. So today it's a very different story. And I think also not only the, um, all of those changes, but the relationship back then was very different. So I remember uh, I, I teach at Berkeley and Cambridge in the UK. And I remember students a while back would ask the typical question in my class on entrepreneurial finance would be, well, how do I meet an investor? And the only thing I could think of uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago was go to a conference like this, stand by the door, and when Jack <laughs> Porter walks out the door, grab him. 
you know. And but now, if you think today about how how democratized that process is, my wife is sitting on the couch watching Shark Tank. She knows more about term sheets than the average angel or VC did. <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, in a funny way. So yeah. it's been com completely democratized. Yeah, definitely so. Francis, how about you? How's this, uh, how's this change affected you being kind of one of the LeanCom founders? It's a massive change. Um, I th thought Randy's comments were really good to provide some context. I wasn't around in the 90s here in Silicon Valley. I was in school. Um, so uh, let me just provide a little bit of background about what we do at Everest. Um, a couple years ago, uh, I graduated from Cornell and I came to Silicon Valley for the first time and I had this vision for how to use technology to unlock human potential. Um, and uh, the, the company that we ended up founding, Everest, helps people achieve personal goals. Um, and our, our vision was that you know, everyone has things that they want to do in life, goals, hopes, aspirations, desires, dreams, but people really struggle to achieve them because they lack organization and support. So most people don't write down the things they want to do, they don't have a process to figure out what steps to take or to fit these steps in their busy lifestyle, so they need a tool. So we thought we could build that. And then most people don't share the things they want to do or their progress, so they can't get encouragement, support, accountability, suggestions. Um, or learn or be inspired by people who've done similar things. And so they need a community and we can provide that. So um, my co-founders, Victor, Catherine, and I came together. We had an awesome board of advisors and we um, met someone at an airport uh, who introduced us to Peter Thiel who provided our first check. Um, and uh, the, I think that um, the, the, you know, the title of this panel is The Power of Purpose and that has been so true in the history of our company. Like I, uh, there's so much that, that, a start, that I've learned about the startup process, and I think financing is a really big part of it. And I think that at the core of what we're talking about here is how companies get financed. Um, I think that the, the, the lean startup has, um, th there's this idea that startups are so inexpensive now compared to the million dollar servers that you can, uh, you can uh, hack for a couple nights and weekends or for several months and launch something and all of a sudden you have the next eBay. And it, it still takes money to build companies. Startups are lean, but you still have to raise. And, um, and I think that uh, in th there's this uh, lean startup theory has really become a dominant school of thought. And one of the um, premises of lean startup is that most companies fail because they build products nobody wants. Um, but I still think there's a lot of startups that fail um, not because they don't build products people want, but because they don't know how to, 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 to raise money. And we had to learn. Um, there's, uh, uh, I think that the seed market now, it used to be you go to Sand Hill Road with a business plan. And now you have to, um, uh, you, you have to go on AngelList and you, instead of raising from one investor, you raise from like 30. Uh, and, and so I, I, you know, I, I'm sure you found that with Jimpack. Did you raise institutional for your first round or did we, you? We did not. Yeah. Um, so I guess you know, my company, Jimpack, is my first company. Uh, similar story, graduated from Harvard College um, and actually came up with the idea to use financial incentives to motivate uh, specifically exercise in our case. Um, and we have an app in which people actually get charged for not exercising, and it's paid for by the people who do exercise. So a very, very specific application of that. Um, but we had a very similar story in that um, my co-founder and I uh, both were non-technical to start with, and yep. we both learned, um, you know, me design and him uh, iOS development to actually code our first version together. We didn't raise any money to start. We launched the product completely bootstrapped. Yep. But once we started getting traction, uh, that's when we realized, okay, we actually need money to hire people, hire a better designer than me to actually build the app um, and make it scalable for the users. Right. Yeah, my companies were all supercomputer companies, so we didn't get to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so you guys were both in the lean area. One of the big things about lean is, you know, this transition from the founder coming up with the idea to the customer coming up with the idea are very engaged. I mean, in all of my career, it was one of these deals where literally I'd be in development of software for two to three years before I ever let a customer see it because of my IP concerns, and then I'd bring it out and hopefully they liked what we built. Very different model today. So what does that look like today, and how did you guys do that? Yeah, I guess we have a very uh, interesting way that we started Gympact. Um, so it actually started as a project when we were in college. Um, and we started out by using a completely paper prototype, no technology whatsoever. Uh, worked with a couple of gyms in Boston, used sign-up sheets, 
um, and recruited people from Craigslist to test out this idea. Um, because I think for us, the lean methodology was uh, proving out the most riskiest assumptions without any tech build. And we, we think that we could do that, and I think a lot of companies can do that. Um, our biggest assumptions were, you know, would people actually sign up to be charged for not exercising? And if they were charged, would they still want to continue to use this product? Um, and finally, you know, would people be motivated um, to exercise using these incentives? And we built the entire thing um, with gym partners before we built the technology. That is a classic lean startup story. That is amazing. Um, I, I'd like to provide a slightly uh, contrarian opinion, slightly different. Now, all, all companies are, are very different in this respect. but. Um, so, you know, the, the classic lean startup model is you launch and you iterate and you iterate and you iterate and you learn from your customers. Um, but uh, and the whole idea is you want to fail as early and often as possible because failure is learning and learning is progress. Um, that's very non Churchillian. Uh, <laughs> failure is not a good thing, right? Um, I think Churchill would, I, I come much more from the Churchill mentality towards like failure, which is that, um, you know, you can have a lot of setbacks, but oftentimes you just have to keep going. Um, and I, I think that um, if you, uh, let's, let's take the car analogy, because we are talking about Tesla earlier. Um, if you tried to launch the Model T today, it, it wouldn't work, right? You have to launch, if you're gonna start, like, launch a new product in the car space, you have to launch a Tesla. The, the bar is so high for the production quality of the experience that you need to provide right out of the gate that um, you can't always go like recruit your, your first customers on Craigslist. Um, and, uh, and so in, in the Lean Startup, they have this uh, acronym MVP. You have to launch a minimum viable product as quickly as possible. But I think we have overstated the V, right? V is like uh, getting higher and higher every year on the internet. And, and oftentimes, when you launch right out of the gate, every, you're condemned by your metrics. You almost need to be viral from day one. You need to be like Mailbox, where, where they were acquired by Dropbox like three weeks after launching because uh, they had built a viral loop before you even got into the product. Um, so I think that, um, uh, I think that there's something uh, uh, there in, um, you know, for, for, in terms of how you test ideas. Um, uh, you can certainly um, you can certainly learn a lot from your customer, um, but there's a lot that you can do um, before before you launch um, to sort of guess how they'll react. Um, I think firms like IDEO do a really good job of that. Um, they they use qualitative insights um, instead of instead of quantitative uh, after hitting the big red button and spending like you know. You know, one, one of the issues, though, is I think, you know, because we're here in Silicon Valley, so 80% of, of probably the discussions that occur at Churchill are technology. But if you take it broader, you can't always build a lean, you know, you can't always use the lean model for if you're going to have innovation and breakthrough in certain spaces. So I think it works for the example that you gave. It maybe works for uh, Everest, but I'm not sure about some other areas. However, the innovation of Kickstarter, or what Kickstarter represents, I yeah. think is, is fascinating in this context of the power shift. Because if you think about Kickstarter, it's not really crowdfunding. It's really early product funding. And there's a great example, um, a case study on Honest Tea. How many people know Honest Tea and Seth Goldman, who started that? Where he, in the case study, which is used at universities all over the world, in the um, early 90s, mid 90s, Seth was already tapping customers to pay for the development and production of his product before that was even in vogue. You look at Kickstarter today, it's enabling thousands of ideas to come to life. They may be costly, actually, if you think about some of the things that have received $10, $10 million in funding for a wrist, you know, for a watch type appliance. And That's a lot not of very other. lean. It's not very lean, is it? But it's very smart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. In the deals I did, I did eight uh, software companies. And then I started investing in these guys doing lean. And I'm like, why didn't I think of bringing customers in to talk about my products? You know? yeah. So it's, it, was, it is an amazing thing that's going on. And, and there's so much you can learn. The paper, we do a lot of um, paper prototypes. And being able to um, get to there without spending a whole bunch of money on tech. Is, is really valuable right now. 
What other uh, dynamics are you seeing? Um, you know, it, it used to be in the dot-com area, we were very much, it was like very focused on Wall Street. Uh, today it's very focused on Main Street, both in terms of, you know, how we get customers and we really get revenue. And now with crowdfunding, how do we get investments it's coming from Main Street? How do you guys see that impacting startup world? You can IPO from day one on AngelList. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> So, Yifan, yeah. why don't you take that one? Yeah, um, so I think uh, the shift from Wall Street to Main Street is mainly about um, the customers and being able to build something that customers want. So I think it's very much in line with the lean methodology where um, you know, rather than trying to go out and build something that's conceptually, like in the founders had this amazing thing, um, it's about going out and actually making sure that people want it. Um, and for us, I think we've, you know, we've always focused on that from day one. Um, we really try to figure out um, kind of the core questions that we're trying to answer. Um, even after building out Gympact as a solid foundation, now we're going into new experiments. Um, our whole thing is we think the incentives can be applied in other areas besides just exercise. So how do we go back and test those other areas, um, making sure that customers actually want those new products? Um, and we go back to the experiment phase where you know every new feature that we build, we want to put it out as soon as possible um, to answer that key question. And then we keep asking more and more questions from there on. Yeah. You know, one of the things you have is, you know, it used to be that like if I was launching a big enterprise app, I'd have a thousand people that could hit me day one. I flipped the switch on the internet and I got a billion people that can hit me from day one. And so the infrastructure, you have no idea what that's going to be like. And then you don't have no idea what the revenues are going to be like. Um, one of the companies we're working with right now, they, they launched in June an iPhone application. They're doing a million dollars a month right now, a million dollars in revenue a month right now. It's unbelievable the power of what the, this, you know, world economy can drive at us. I, I love your Wall Street, Main Street point. Um, I actually, so in, in many ways this is progress, right? We, we're talking about how great this is, this move from Wall Street to Main Street. I kind of miss Wall Street. Um, <laughs> I don't. Not that I had I any idea. Is that you, you've actually taken two companies public. Um, but I think the nice thing about the way the 90s worked is that the, the venture capital industry needed to think really big. Um, and I just, I, I think with a lot of these companies that raise angel funding, break even, and, and they, they're, they're lean and they're great companies, but they don't need to think from the beginning, how does this become a $100 billion business, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that led them to Wall Street. Um, and, and I think that, uh, the, the structure of the capital markets is something Randy knows a lot about, and I'd love to get your, your takes on this, but, but it creates, it, it really frames how entrepreneurs start, right? Um, and the nice thing about the 90s was, hey, yeah, we're, we're gonna invest in 100 companies, 99 of them are gonna totally fail, but let's find the craziest ideas we can because um, like we need to think big because one thing is gonna have to return everything else. And, um, I think that those days are, that are largely gone, and, and I, that's sad. Um, I think that one of the dangers of the lean startup is um, if everyone needs to be really, really lean, right, you can't bootstrap Google, right? You, 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 uh, you, you end up starting things that are easier to prove traction on, easier to validate your business model, and, and so you tend to focus on smaller markets and smaller problems mm -hmm. instead of big, hard, hard problems. And the entrepreneurs that I admire, like Elon Musk, goes and finds the hardest problem he can and attacks it like a lion. Um, and that, that, I think, that boldness um, is, is something I miss from the swashbuckling, we can do anything days of the 90s <laughs> that I never got to experience. That is, I'm an entrepreneur born in the wrong era. <laughs> that is a negative. How many in here are in the venture capital industry? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now we we can say anything. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, how can we have a Churchill event without venture capital? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I often tease people at parties when they ask me, you know, what's my background? They say I'm a recovering venture capitalist. <laughs> and it's, it's to this point that in the, in the 80s and 90s, and mid-90s is when I founded Outlook Ventures, which had a 12-year run. And then at the end of that run, I started realizing how that industry was getting so bent out of shape chasing Wall Street and chasing returns. And I really love what I do now as an angel because I can just work with a couple of companies at a time. And this phenomenon that you're talking about, the pressure is not on how do we get to the next phase to get to the next phase to get to the next phase. It's about 
pleasing the customer and knowing that there are companies out there that have the distribution set up or have the um, foundation that we can sell to if we need to get bigger, they can take it to the next step. But so you've got a lot of entrepreneurs today that, that aren't, don't feel like they need to create the billion dollar company. They're happy just create, filling a need in the market and then wait and see what happens. But do you think selling to Google, you know, like 10, you know, a year in is, is necessarily a good thing for, for entrepreneurs to... It is if the alternative is to go out of business. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I think good that's answer. one of the things we have now that we never had in my career. In my yeah. career, you had to hit the $50 million, $100 million exit, and there was no exit at $5 million and at $10 million. So right. if you got to product market fit, you got a great team together, and the customers didn't pick up, you were just hosed. You know, there was nothing you could do about it. Now there's a great market right I think, there. And I think it differs by the person. I mean, if, you, if we ask for a show of hands, how many would be happy you know, to cash out after a few years with $20 million? Some people will raise their hand. If you said, how many want to create a billion dollar company? Some people will raise their hand. So it's really your constitution. It's what, what drives you personally, what, you, what impact you want to have, and how much time uh, and you know, uh, uh, sacrifice you're willing to per put. Perfect setup for the last part of this, which is one of the big changes I saw was this change between mercenaries, and I guess I'd have be in that role, and missionaries. And I think that right now, one of the things that you do see with young startups that I really like, I actually like that attitude of going, I want to swing and hit a home run here. Yeah. And so they're not just missionaries around um, their their uh, you know contribution and things like that, but around their passion in their life, mm -hmm. and so yeah. you know they want to change the world, and I love that. I think that's a, actually a neat part. So you had that one, so why don't you pick that one up? Yeah, uh, well, it actually ties in directly to what we were. The link between what we were talking about earlier is um, a lot of the lean mentality is you, um, you 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 try to build a product that customers want, but the famous Ford line is if I built what people wanted, they'd ask for a faster horse, right? Um, so, uh, I think of it almost like the, the debate in, in economics between de uh, demand side and supply side economics, right? A lot of lean startup is, is trying to find out what are problems that people know about and are willing to pay for, right? And, and so, like, you tend to find the stubbed toes. It's like, damn it, I just stubbed my toe on this, and I'm like Cisco, and I'm stubbing my toe on this, and like, fix my stubbed toe, and I'll pay $50 million for that. Um, the, the visionary company has to like play chess and think a lot of steps ahead, or or or, or sort of like Steve Jobs, like uh, tap into this deep empathy for, uh, for 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 a problem, or that is is hard to explain, almost ineffable, right? Um, but those those missionaries, as you put it, they're not motivated by um, building. Um, Sol solving problems people know they want. They're trying to solve the problems that people, they're, they're trying to build a product that people don't even know they want yet, but when they see it, they'll go, oh my God, that's amazing. Um, and I could I expand on that, there's a lot to say. But, I think I yeah. actually disagree slightly with what Yay. you're saying um, exactly. to provide some <laughs> other perspective. Um, I, I think that the difference here, there's not kind of this binary difference where if it's a big problem, it necessarily needs to be a big solution or a very expensive solution. I think there are many big problems where you can have a very simple kind of lean solution to go after that. Um, I, I actually think that when it comes to missionaries, um, what I see are people who believe in solving the big problems rather than the small problems. Um, but the method that the, they go about doing it, you know, for some things, uh, like Elon Musk and Tesla, like that is a really huge solution that needs a lot of capital to go after it. But there's many other people who go after the small, elegant solutions. Um, and I think the lean methodology is very applicable to those. And to, to add on to that, I think Lori was talking before about uh, social entrepreneurship and, and giving you lots of examples, Kiva right. and several others. And there's a huge shift to that, as yeah. well as what you guys are talking mm -hmm. about. And if you think about it, a, a big part of that shift, it's a shift in consciousness. You can see it even in corporate leadership, right? That's happening with corporate social responsibilities become a very big issue for large companies. Social entrepreneurship is sort of the buzz, is the hot buzzword today, so why? Um, one key reason is in the late, in, in the 08, 09 financial disaster global meltdown, I think a lot of people lost their jobs, they had a lot of time to sit at home and think about 
how can I have a life of purpose, to come back to the topic here, um, how can I have a life of purpose and something I can be passionate about? I noticed the students uh, that I teach to also were coming to me and saying, you know, instead of doing a project on being a mercenary, I want to do a project on doing social good. At first, I, I was confused. And then after I heard this enough times, I thought, oh, wow, they want to do good and do well at the same time. So you've got a conscious shift at all levels of society, probably brought about by all of us getting knocked on the side of the head uh, with our excesses of borrowing here in the US and abroad, and, and, and sort of settling down and saying, well, OK, what are we doing with our lives? So I think that shift um, has to do with an alignment of personal, if you look at founders, like you two, I think it's probably, I'm going to guess, an alignment of, of personal beliefs with your business beliefs, more so than you would have seen 20 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that um, you know, 20 years ago, it was really, there was almost not a consciousness towards that. And then as it moved forward, people that would kind of went through that mode, and I get hit with it on a daily basis. I've got some ex-entrepreneur that's doing some real good thing because he's now done being an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and now he's going to go do the good thing. Yeah. And what I love now is now people yeah. are like out of the gates going, I'm going to do both, and I'm going to do it right now. And, and also, look at our role models, and look at our role models' partners. So our role models, you know, Pierre Omidyar makes a fortune starting eBay, and instead of taking it all and doing whatever, he takes a huge portion of it, and he and his wife, Pamela, have been giving back to social entrepreneurship. The same with Jeff Skull, also of eBay. The same with Bill Gates, um, and, you, and the list goes on and on. So a lot of the, uh, although I can't say everyone, I can't say everyone is doing this, um, but I think you know, often the Silicon Valley gets criticized for not giving back enough, but if you look at the concentration of wealth and, and, and those that have done extremely well, billionaires, yeah. actually many of them are giving a, a huge portion. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg just making all kinds of announcements. And, and, and he's very early in the cycle. You know, it didn't even take him very long to think, this is what I want to do. Uh, Mark Andreessen. And they all, I noticed, almost uh, all of them, I, I can think of one exception, but almost all of them have a partner, a life partner, who has, seems to have dramatically changed their viewpoint. Or maybe you could say one plus one equals three. So, and, and I think Bill and Melinda Gates are probably a great example of that if you think about Bill before Melinda and Bill with Melinda. So it seems to be a huge shift. And I've heard that Laureen is getting very active. She just funded one of my friend's nonprofits. It's an incredible education profit, a nonprofit. And um, you know, so yeah, it's amazing what the spouses and partners do. So time is saying we're done. Are we okay? Or what do you do you want to open it up for questions? What do you what's let's have five minutes of questions. Cool. Okay. Um, I've got people back there waving like this. So. <laughs> Maybe we should <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should prompt them. What about purpose um, and power uh, is, or are you curious about? The relationship between power and purpose. Someone jump in there. Go ahead. <laughs> So I'm one of those people trying to solve one of those big problems, and I started my company with venture capital back in 2007, just before the financial collapse. <laughs> so um, here I am, you know, low these many years later, trying to figure out how do I take it to the next step. I've done the work, I've got the technology developed to um, be able to figure out a way to replace aging coal plants with geothermal, and you know, I'm trying to see, you know, listening to you guys talking about a lean way to do things, I'm thinking, okay, lean, I have to spend $5 million to drill this well. I don't know how to do that without any money. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just like, some of these big problems seem intractable, and yet the purpose is still there, the problem's still there, and, and you know, I, I, I just like trying to get a way, a path, 
forward to, to get it solved. Can I, I, I think one of the things that you, you have is um, people mistake, I think, lean for cheap. Yeah. Lean means learn. That's what it means. Learn as quickly as you possibly can. And sometimes that's at very, very large levels, and sometimes that's at very low levels. Sometimes we can do paper prototyping and learn very, very quickly, and sometimes we can't. Um, I, like you were saying, to be like developing a Tesla, it's hard to learn that with a paper pa prototype. I, right. I doubt you guys did a lot of paper prototypes, did you? <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think that's the misconception, though. Uh, but persevere, never give in, never give in. <laughs> Lift up your hearts, all will come right. Uh, through the through the struggle, um, uh, you'll find a way. Um, and and I think that that fidelity to the problem and your your passion for that problem um, is what will carry you through. And um, I think that is a I think when you decide that something is valuable to you, the universe immediately asks you how much are you willing to pay for it. <laughs> right. Uh, if you really really value the potential impact you could make. Um, if you really, really value what your company is doing and you believe in it, um, it's, it's almost like from the second you start your company, you're getting shaken. And, and it's like, are you willing to sacrifice this much? How about this much? How about this much? And sometimes you just have to keep going for a long time. Uh, I really resonated with what Lori was talking about when Tesla, you know, the, the whole industry was, everyone was saying, no, this isn't going to work. No, this isn't going to work. When you are starting a company, you are making a very contrarian statement. It's inefficient, not efficient market theory. If efficient market theory is correct, your company would have already been started and funded. Um, you, you're basically, as a founder, you know, getting on some rooftop, top, finding some megaphone and shouting at the top of your lungs, everybody is wrong. The world is wrong. The markets are wrong. If you guys were right, this would already exist, but it's not, so I'm starting it. And so it's this contrarian statement. You have to be resilient and develop that like toughness to keep going. And I think that that refusal to give in or give up is uh, something that I admire Churchill for. And I think that like it is very much lost in this idea that like somehow we need to ask customers, is this right? Is this right? No, just like build it right. Um, that was so, sort of Steve Jobs. So. so it sounds like your answer is you need to get his phone number. And when you need a, <laughs> when you need a motivational speech. <laughs> I, actually, I do think I'll it's leave one that of those, to Tony Robbins. I think it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of times when you're a founder, you're like, why? No one would put up with this, and but I will. I'll step up and do it. You know, and and that yes. get, the more you do it, the longer you do it, the farther you're ahead of everybody. And I think most founders that have done big deals would go, there's five or six times this company should have gone out of business, and I pushed way through, and what I found was that hole was like an inch away from where I was at, and I could have given up. And yes. I just, it just completely yeah. changed. So you said time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.